On today's episode, we're going to be talking about vineyards. Now, I bet you didn't know that we do actually have our very own vineyard here at Beaver. We put it in about four years ago and we've been cropping wine just quietly with an amazing company called Halfpenny. And I'm going to be chatting to Martin Vickers in a little while. It's funny, isn't it? Britain isn't always thought of as being one of the biggest growers of wine in the world, but it's happening and it's evolving quicker than we know. And we're on that bandwagon. So come with me and I really hope you enjoy this episode. I think he's rather special. So, Martin, thank you for coming up today it's a from Hapney Green. Hapney Green. South Stuffs. So, tell us about yourself and what you do. Okay, well, we're, I, I still say Hapney, but most people say Halfpenny now. Um, from a farming background, I started planting vines 40 years ago as a serious hobby and then subsequently open to the public and for the last 30 odd years we've been entertaining the public with restaurants and tea rooms and uh, and so on and the vineyards slowly developing and putting our own winery in creating uh, some beautiful wines and as we've evolved we've started making wine for other vineyards all over the country. How many vineyards all over the country? Well actually it's almost a hundred now from 28 counties. That's amazing. And how did we actually meet you in the beginning? I think one of our salesmen came to you um, to try and sell you some of our wine. And, and told us that you could actually produce the wine for, for us from our vineyard. Exactly. Then you've got the land and that you, why not plant a vineyard? Yeah. Mm. Tell, tell us about our vineyard. Uh, tell yeah. us, which grapes have we got growing there? Exactly? Right, you've got, you've got four varieties. One is called Siegerebe. That's a, a German variety, which is early ripening. Um, you have a, an early Pinot Noir, which of course is French, um, a red one. And then a one called Solaris, which again is a well-proven German hybrid. And one called Saval Blanc, which is a French-American hybrid. And that between them, uh, they're going to be able to produce you um, white wine, red wine, and sparkling wine, and rosé. And in fact, the whole range, which is what you need really for, for the public. Goodness. So we're going to produce red, white, rosé. And sparkling. And sparkling. Absolutely. And how many, just let's look at this year. Just mm. let's go through. What have we actually produced this year? Well, over 20,000 bottles. Goodness. Which From surprised how many acres of... only five acres. Wow. Which surprised me. I mean, we normally talk about a conservative 2,000 to the acre. So I, my forecast was around about 10,000 bottles. So it's but it was double that. So panic. Where well, am I going to <laughs> sell all this wine? Yeah. Well, I mean, fortunately, the, the, the perception now, I mean, we, we, went, we went through a period in the 90s when English wine was struggling, if, if I, I must admit. Um, but now the perception of English wine has changed. I think the credibility is there. The industry, uh, just to, to, to fill you in, there's, there's around about four, four and a half thousand hectares of vines in the UK at the moment. Uh, but around four to 500 hectares are being planted every year. So it's the fastest growing agricultural sector. In fact, there's now more land under vines for winemaking than soft fruit. But it's, it is still tiny. We're only producing 15 million bottles a year and we're drinking 1,600 million. So the market is there and the perception is there. And I think people also, after Brexit and after COVID, they're looking to buy local more. So I, th I think the future is really good. Do you? I do. So I was mm. looking, uh, Martin, in the archives just mm. to see if we would had any information here of... Um, wine being grown through history, because obviously the castle has been here forever. Mm. There is some knowledge of the fact that there was a vineyard here in, mm. in Roman times. Roman times it would be. Yeah. 
when I suppose maybe the temperatures were slightly different to how they are now. Yeah, um, there's uh, well-proven records of uh, Roman vineyards all the way up into Yorkshire. So I, I, it would be, I'd be very surprised if there weren't vineyards here. But they knew what they were doing because they'd got their own vineyards in Italy. They planted the very first wine, uh, vines in France. The Romans did. And then, when, of course, when they occupied the UK, they, pl they planted vineyards to make the wine for themselves as they went along. So it's quite possible. So how many years, Martin, now is it that we've actually been running the vineyard? Well, you planted in 2019. Yes. So, so we had our first crop in... 21. You had a very light crop. And unfortunately, there was some uh, spring frost in 20, which affected the yield slightly. Um, but uh, yeah, you had a light crop in 21. And then, of course, the full first full crop uh, last year in 22. So they'll crop like that. I mean, they, they're capable of cropping. They can live longer than us, you know, vines looked after properly. Goodness. There's examples in the, on the continent of vines cropping at 150 years old, so... That's amazing. So actually, you brought along a bottle. Oh my goodness! Yes, you have. and look how smart it is with oh, your wow. and your label. Doesn't that look, look good? At that. You know, and I think um, it does look very regal, doesn't it? Yeah, and you've got the, the story on the back. That's the Capability Brown Plan. <laughs> yeah, of course. Landscape and a little bit of the story. How lovely! Yeah, yeah because it was one of his last. At uh, last ever landscapes. Yes, which was never actually completed, no, was it? Wasn't I remember. No, it was in his lifetime. No. So I've had great joy in finishing it off. And do you think, Martin, we've got a quite an exciting future with wine in this country? Definitely. Tell me where yeah. it's going in your, yeah. in your mind. The, the credibility is there, and I think that's because of the quality of English wine now. And people are starting to realise that um, they're looking for estate grown and bottled. Um, it, it, it's incredible how much comes into this country in tankers from the Southern Hemisphere. And I think people are beginning to realise that. But if it's estate grown, then, you know, that, that it's quality that they're looking for. So when it goes into the tankers, what actually happens? Well, loads of preservatives no. um, and loads more sulfites than you would normally need. Because if you can imagine a wine made in Chile or in Australia or New Zealand, for that matter, uh, it's much cheaper to, to move it in bulk. So it's, at the time it should have been bottled, it's pumped into a 25,000 litre bladder, put in a container brought up to, say, Liverpool, then travels to Coventry or Northampton to a vast bottling plant, pumped then again into a more vats and then into a bottling line. Whereas this, this bottle has been, this has been bottled at the optimum time, carefully picked by hand, transported to the winery, fermented and bottled um, without all those preservatives and additives. Big, big difference. Just out of interest, uh, Duchess, where would someone be able to buy a bottle of your wine? Well, that's a very good question. So I'm trying to work that one out on lots of levels, but mm. we will have a little off license at the engine yard, so I'm hoping mm -hmm. to sell it from yeah. there. And I'll also sell it to anyone who comes here for a wedding or an event. Of course. It doesn't really feel right to be talking about this wonderful produce and not try some, does it? No, it doesn't. I was hoping you were going to... Uh... I'll get one of my runners. Hang on. It's really good. Oh, there we are. Ah, the one that... Excellent. ...that were poured earlier. Mm. So this, just talk me through this mm. when we're trying this. Mm. First the nose. Yep. What can you smell there? Yep. Well, I think it's it's very typical of English wine. It's got that floral, hedgerow-y sort of, um, that lovely, lovely nose. I mean, we're not um, famous for heavy... 14, 15% wines in, in the UK. Yes, so anyway. So it's lighter. I think it's 12, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. 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 I ought to just check and tell you. No, it's 11 and a half. And I think there's a, there's a trend towards that, you know. People are looking for slightly lower alcohol wines, you know, for, for health reasons. Yeah. And it means you can drink more of it. Oh, of course. <laughs> Always very helpful. So, okay. So what else can you tell me about the smell of that wine? Right. And the colour, of course. Yeah. Yes, just a sort of um, a light, light straw colour. You know, it looks excellent, doesn't it? Well, I, it? It is important, actually, the look of the wine, isn't it? It is important. That's what we should have done first, really, before we... Oh, really? Yeah. Before smelling it. Yeah. Look at it first. Yeah. And then I don't know whether you've ever tried... Have you ever tried doing this? Put your hand over the top, give it a swirl to release that nose, mm -hmm. and it gets more concentrated. Oh, yes. Do you notice the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So now we taste it. Yeah. 
Okay. You got to tell me what. Mm. The professional way of doing it is just to draw a little bit of area with it and then spit it out, but we won't be doing that, will we? That's lovely, isn't it? It's dry, but it's not acidic, so tartaric acids are, are quite low. And nice fruit. I mean, that is, as, I think, is as good as any any dry white wine. Well, here's to you. Yeah, and you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Delicious. Isn't it lovely? That was really nice. I haven't tried it for ages. You tried it, Mum. Do you normally drink in this time of this time of day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you've enjoyed the video and want to see more, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next episode.